Welcome to the Nehemiah Entrepreneurship Community Podcast. I'm your host, Patrice Saguet, and we are still dealing with our series on on um, on George Floyd, and we are concluding the series actually uh, with a message that I'm going to do today for you, uh, titled "The Journey to Freedom: A Redemptive Look at Life's Trials and Triumphs Through the Eyes of Joseph." Um, all of us, the last several weeks, several months, even before the George, the George Floyd incident, uh, it's been a painful period for not just those of us here in America, but all of us around the world. Um, and I just wanted to have a, this is a, a, a talk that I put together several years ago. That was a part of, it was before Obama became president. And I, and I put it together uh, as a as a series, uh, an educational series to help prepare African Americans um, and 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 blacks in general to be able to to think redemptively and to rise above uh, prejudice and injustices and, and to forgive and to embrace their destiny. Uh, when Obama got elected president, I, I presume that um, you know I, it was no longer needed because I felt that the Obama um presidency it was a reflective of a pro-racial america and and that it was going to be a lot of healing uh, not just to african americans but to the nation in general in terms of racial uh issues but it didn't do that as a matter of fact it may have even created more challenges uh to that or revealed that we had more cracks and so recently with the george Floyd incident i i decided to bring back uh this series uh, call the journey uh, to freedom, and uh, it used to be titled the the journey from from trial to triumph. I retitled the journey to freedom because that's what we all pursuing, right? In the end of the day, we are all pursuing freedom. We are pursuing freedom from poverty, freedom from sin, uh, pursuing freedom from trouble, freedom from trial, freedom from uh, from difficulties, from headache, and even freedom from from this world. As we one day will spend our destiny with our Savior, and so. So this is uh, particularly a message that is critical for African Americans, uh, for Blacks, but but for for everybody, uh, for everybody, all of those. If you've ever faced life's trials and challenge, if the last several months been difficult for you, if COVID nineteen been difficult for you, whatever you've gone through, if you face parental abuse, if you face marital abuse, um, if you face any kind of uh, pain due to some kind of injustice or uh, or, or at the hands of others, this is a great message for you. So I'm going to kind of give during this podcast a, 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 a an outline of this and kind of share this. Uh, this uh, this message I'm about to share with you today, we're releasing a, a, a piece of that each week during our during our weekly devotionals. So if you don't if you don't receive our weekly devotionals, I want to encourage you to um, to sign up to become an e-community member. Sign up for that so you can start getting the weekly devotionals. Uh, if you do get them, each week you will get a piece of this. At the end of the devotional series, we're going to turn this into a a, 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 um, a small group study group, a study uh, t- to be done by cross, cross-racial, cross cross-social individuals to walk through together, to journey together to freedom. Um, and then we'll also turn it eventually into a course that will be available on our e-community platform. I want to thank all of those who've been guests with us in the last several weeks as they shared their perspectives, as they shared uh, uh, their uh, their insights around racial racial injustice, around uh, around unity, and around how do we come together. And I particularly want to thank Charles Kears for stepping up to lead this process. So tomorrow I'm going to have my pastor I'm going to interview my pastor uh, here with us, and that will kind of conclude uh, uh, our discussion on George Floyd. And then uh, we, we've put together a landing page, and we've been putting things together to, to launch Charles into now continuing the urban impact vision. We'll, be, we'll keep you posted and keep you updated. If you want to be a part, want to join us in that, just let us know, uh, email us, or reach out to Charles or to our office, and we'll connect you with, with that effort. So. If you have a Bible, so if you have questions as I share this message or comments, feel free to participate um, to that. 
If, if you have a Bible, uh, turn it to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 45, uh, Genesis chapter 45, and, and I'm going to read our foundation of scripture uh, for this series. Uh, uh, it's, I'm going to start reading at verse 7, uh, Genesis 45, uh, verse 7. This is at the conclusion of the interaction between Joseph and his brothers. As they have been, as Joseph has been going back and forth with his brothers, um, and and struggling with what they had done to him, and struggling with distrust of them, and struggling with how to reconcile between who that he now sees in need, which is their, his brothers, and what they had done to him years prior. I'm actually going to start at verse one, uh, chapter forty-five of Genesis. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him and he cried out. You know, so at this point, the brothers have no idea that, that Joseph is their brother. Um, and, uh, and so all this while they're thinking Joseph's an Egyptian. And Joseph at this moment, he, he couldn't restrain himself anymore because he was full of so much emotion. And he cried out, he screamed, all right? Which was something that wasn't um, common in a in a in an Egyptian culture, that a, somebody in that kind of position would be so emotional. And he says this: "Make everyone go out from me." So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept out loud, and the Egyptian and the house of Pharaoh heard it. So here is the second in command of Egypt, full of emotion. He begins to weep. And he now reveals himself to his brother and he says, I am Joseph. Think about that. Think about how those brothers felt when they knew that the man who they had sold into slavery was standing before him with all powers and resources of Egypt other than besides Pharaoh. He says, then, I'm Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed as present. They were afraid. And they said to his, and then, and Joseph said to his brother, peace, come near to me. So they came near, then he said, and notice something, there's another message that I do on the process of forgiveness, where Joseph here, he, 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 you know, he brings them near, that's intimacy, right? You know, this now Joseph, the, the walls is coming down. He, he, he's no longer, this, this facade is no longer there. He says, come near. And part of that is also to break down the walls, to remove the fears, right? He says, come near me. And he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into, into Egypt, right? So Joseph didn't sugarcoat. If we're going to, if you're going to overcome what you've been through, if you're going to, whether it's racial injustice, whether it's economic injustice, whether it's whatever it is, um, if you're going to, social injustice, if you're going to overcome whatever you, you've been through, you cannot sugarcoat it. You cannot throw it under the the rug, the rugs. You you, you have to face it straight on. So this is what he says. He says. So he said, "I'm Joseph, your brother, who sold the slavery. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life." You said, Patrice, why do you start here as you talk about journey to freedom? At this very moment, Joseph got his freedom. Because Joseph discovered that though what the devil meant for evil, God used it for good. In other words, Joseph recognized at this point, after all those years of trial and struggle, slavery, prison, the pit, all of that, he came to this one conclusion that. It wasn't his brother's fault because God had a plan for him and God used them, them to accomplish his plan. As wicked as their action was, as painful as it was, he forgave them, releasing them of it and turning it to God's plan. You know, true freedom is when you start blaming others for your circumstance. True freedom is when you forgive your enemy. True freedom is when you release those who hurt you. True freedom is when you say, I forgive you, true freedom, that's true freedom. So here's my question to you. 
No matter what you've gone through, are you truly free? Are you truly free? And you know, you because because see, marching doesn't set you free. Mar marching doesn't set you free. Now it's okay to march if you if you if you need to march, please go ahead. But that won't set you free. Definitely, writing is not going to set you free for sure. Being of the pe person who hurts you is not going to set you free, right? Releasing the people that hurt you, you know, being angry at your father, at your mother, at the police, being mad at your friend, at your husband, your boyfriend, whoever that is, is not going to set you free. True freedom is when you can come to a place where you can declare this. John, Susan, Thomas, whoever the name is, you can say, do not be grieved or angry with yourself because you did this to me. I forgive you. For here's what God used. Here's how God used you to do in my life. That's true freedom. So, but how did Joseph get there? All right, so, so journey to freedom. How, how do we go from where we are to get to where Joseph got to, right? And that's our objective here. So. So, so this, so this, um, this discussion on gender freedom. By the way, if you're, if you're, um, thanks for joining, uh, brother, brother Barnes. Good to have you here, Nancy and Barnes. Um, you know, my um, this Sunday, I, I'm doing a message at, at Anthem Church, the church where I belong, with my past, and we and we we teach on this interactively and walk through this together. So, if you remember Anthem, or if you are. No, go to anthemfamily.org, anthemfamily.org, and you can learn more about Anthem and join us this Sunday as we have worship together around that. So, is there a redemptive purpose for struggle? As you're facing trials and, and tests, how do you go through it in a redemptive way? Are you willing to journey with somebody else of another race, another culture, to experience true healing through dialogue and forgiveness? And that's what this is about. This is about a framework to allow for discussion for healing and restoration. Because let me share this with you. Whoever did what to you is not your enemy. We, have, we all have one enemy, that's the devil. We all have one problem, that's sin. And until we understand that, we're not gonna truly experience true freedom. So we wanna use this to create a framework for you to have redemptive dialogue with your loved ones, with individuals um, that are in your circle of influence so that you might be able to truly become free. Whether you're white, black, Spanish, Asian, doesn't matter, we all need to be free. We all have been wounded along the way, and we all have faced difficulties. I'm going to use the life of Joseph here. I'm going to refer a lot to the African American experience, but all of us ought to be able to relate to, relate to this. So, so in, in the journey to freedom, the first thing that we must do, we must acknowledge, we must reignite our dream. We must reignite our dream. See, Joseph began his journey as a dreamer, right? In other words, what what dreams have you allowed the struggle of life and the trials of life, your the difficulty of life, to go dormant? What dreams have you forgotten or released or given up on because of the trials and tests that you face? Because if you if you no longer dream, if you stop dreaming, then you're gonna remain bitter because you're gonna blame those who got you to stop dreaming. Now, besides us reigniting our personal dreams, can we all embrace Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream for America? In other words, this moment, can we all recommit ourselves from the White House to the jail house? Can we all recommit ourselves to Martin Luther King's dream for America? If you don't know what that dream is, you better go back and look it up. Can we reignite ourselves to that dream? And, and can we dream of a better America, an America that is prosperous, an America that is, that is, um, that is without racial tension, an America that, that has true justice, an America 
that reflects who we know we are and the best in all of us. Whatever country you're in, can you dream of your country that way? In your family, can you dream that way? In other words, because you're not truly gonna be free if you are not able to dream again. I want you to look at Genesis uh, chapter 37. Genesis 37, this is where it all began for Joseph. So Genesis, I want you to look at verse uh, five. So verse five, again, if you have questions or comments, put it up as I go through, I'm gonna share those with the audience as well. Genesis uh, verse five. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. You see, Joseph had a dream, understand this. You may have forgotten your dream or let go of your dream because your dream brought, brought trouble upon you. You might say, Patrice, you understand, it was because of my dream that I stopped facing all these issues, because of my dream that I began to struggle. Bring it back up. It was their jealousy, not your dream. You have to learn to identify dream killers and go past them. All of us are gonna have dream killers. Black, white, child, it doesn't matter, all of us. Life is full of dream killers. The devil is a dream killer. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. So, so, the, so the boys were jealous of Joseph because of his dream. Yeah, so your dream is gonna, is gonna yield at first jealousy and envy. But dream, dream. There was a time in the black experience where, where Africa, blacks in Africa were great. There were kings, there were royalty, they dreamed. They had visions and, you know, right now today, Africa is the poorest continent in the world with 90% of the world's poor. It wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. There was a moment. This is why the Europeans went into Africa for resources. For resources. You know, so, so do not think of where you're from, your heritage, as slavery or colonialism or poverty. Go back further and you'll see a moment in time where you were among the greats. All cultures have had their moments of greatness. All cultures, because we are all creating God's image and likeness. Asians, Indians, Africans, Hispanic, all cultures have had their season of greatness. This season is, is the season of the West. All cultures have had their season of greatness because we are all creating God's image and likeness. So the dream. So can you dream again? Can you wake up that dream? Can you reignite? Do not let the, 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 the social issues of, the, of America, do not let the challenge that you're facing, do not let the, what you're hearing on the news, do not let any of that to cause you not to dream. So number one, if we're gonna be free, we gotta dream again. We gotta keep our dream alive. Number two, the dream unfortunately leads to betrayal. So you've got to be mindful that you may be betrayed again. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say, you may be betrayed again, you see. And, and we have to admit that our ancestors, our forefathers, betrayed their own. Because understand this, out of envy and jealousy leads to betrayal. Remember Cain and Abel? Right, Cain and Abel, right? Because of jealousy and envy, Cain betrayed Abel. Remember Adam and Eve? They betrayed God, right? And they, they were actually the ones that first birthed the idea of betrayal. And that has continued. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, right? So betrayal. So, so, so here's the question. You, you, so you got to be open and understand that you may be betrayed again and be, look out for it so you can know how to navigate it, how to, how to dance around it. I had to forgive more quickly. So can we admit that we once betrayed somebody else or that our ancestors betrayed their own? Can we agree that our forefathers 
because they betrayed their fellow man due to their sinful nature, that's what's led to all this suffering and all the, the consequence we face in the day. The Africans betrayed the Africans and that led to African-Americans being in America, right? The, the Europeans betrayed each other. Europeans betrayed Africans, right? Europeans betrayed the Indians. There's all this, I mean, throughout history, you know, the Chinese and the Japanese. I mean, you go to any culture, the, 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 the Germans and the Jews, right? Somebody was telling me yesterday, my pastor, I was telling about the, the, the Irish and the Irish <laughs> betrayal, right? So there's this seed of betrayal in the human soul that have led to, among other things, slavery. Right, betrayal. So you will be betrayed. You have been betrayed, but you can get through it. And Joseph was betrayed. L look at Genesis 37. L look at uh, verse 16. Actually, no, let, let's look at, uh, yeah, let's look at verse 18. Now, when they saw him afar off, so Joseph's brother, father sent him to look out for his brother, right? And as he's coming to do well by his brother, look what happened. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they, inspired, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some, some, some pit. We shall say some wild beast devoured him we shall see what will become of his dream. You see, the purpose of the betrayal is to destroy the dream. And you know it wasn't them that were doing it. It wasn't the, these guys. It was the devil. Because think about it. Why would somebody want to kill their own brother? It wasn't Cain. It was the devil. Right? It was the devil. You see, the devil seeks to kill steal and destroy our dreams. He just uses humans to do it because he's a coward. Do not turn against your brother because the devil used them to betray you. Betrayal is a part of lying. So if you're gonna be free, you have to accept that, that you've been betrayed and that you will be betrayed. But the question, what do you do about it now? Right, so betray. So Joseph was betrayed. If you're going to walk from free from 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 uh, to if you're going to walk to freedom, you're going to have to learn how to face betrayal. The the third thing that Joseph faced was the struggle. The struggle. So if if you're going to um, journey to freedom, you're going to face struggle because after the betrayal comes the struggle. Right, and for Joseph, his struggle was the pit the slavery in the prison, right? That those were his, it was years of struggle, right? Close to 16 years of struggles, right? So can we recognize the effects of this betrayal, right? Some of us face struggles due to inequities in our systems and others struggle on how to deal with the pains of the past and its consequences. You know, one of the things my pastor and I, as we were talking about this during the Sunday message, one of the things that we talked about is, is how whites need to be sensitive to the, the real life struggle of African-Americans that is a result of slavery and as a result of Jim Crow segregation, as a result of all the things that's happened, right? The idea that a, that a black parent has to talk to a, a black boy um, specifically about how to avoid being killed by the police. Most whites do not have to do that, right? I mean, just, just acknowledge that that does happen and, and that it shouldn't be happening, and many are right now, right? The idea of, of so many black boys being killed by the police, right? It's not all police officer, right? It's, it's, it's yes, more blacks get killed through black on black crime than with the police, but but it should not diminish the fact that it's important to recognize that struggle, right? See, recognizing somebody's struggle doesn't mean you condone how they react about it. 
It's sympathy. You know, a woman that have been raped and her struggling to date or struggling in a relationship, right? No matter how she may misbehave, it doesn't mean you're condoning her behavior, but you're just recognizing that she has legitimate struggles because she was betrayed. A, a, a young man or woman who, who struggles to life because of bad parenting or because they were abandoned by their parents or what these are legitimate situations. You need to sympathize with it. In other words, acknowledging people's struggle doesn't mean that you condone their behavior. Recognizing that even white males have struggle, right? I mean, think about it. The fact that everybody is blaming you for something that happened and you were not even born yet. Think about that. I mean, as a black man, I can't understand it because I'm not white. But that is the weight. Wherever you go, whatever you do as a white male, you feel this weight that you have to sometimes justify or do something to make up for what your ancestors did. That is a legitimate struggle. That is a legitimate struggle. And so it carries, it's, you know, that, that causes you to be a little bit insecure. Yes, a white male can be insecure. Or a woman. Right, a woman, the life struggle of, of over and over again being paid less or being overlooked or, or, or being told she can't do it just because she's a woman. That's a legitimate struggle. Right? Or an immigrant in America. Right? Legitimate struggle. Or a, a, a woman who had abortion and now feel guilty about it. We need to understand that she's going to struggle because she knows she did wrong. She killed the baby, no matter what level that child was. That's the legitimate struggle. Just because you sympathize with it doesn't mean you condone the behavior. Or a Black and African-American who feels the need to shout out Black Lives Matter and put on their Facebook page or have the sign, whatever it is, or go in the march because of the struggle, right? Just because you affirm their struggle or you sympathize with their struggle or you lend your support to this doesn't mean you condone the behavior, right? Let, let me speak to my conservative friends. You know, I'm, I'm a conservative. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a, I'm an independent, I'm not a Republican or Democrat, but I'm a conservative because I, I do believe in conservative values. But sometimes we conservatives are afraid to, to come alongside and sympathize with people's pains because we're afraid of the politics. Let me tell you something, we gotta stop being afraid of that. Wrong is wrong, regardless of the politics. That's why I try to be above the politics. I don't care who's who's president. I don't care what part, because understand this, my hope doesn't come from Washington. My hope does not come from Washington. My hope comes from Jesus. I don't care who's president, the will of God be done. I know some of my friends who feel strongly that unless laws have changed, unless this person is president or governor, unless whatever it is, then nothing is gonna, things can be for the better. I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher. My first commitment, is not to a state, is not to a government, it's to Jesus. That's my role. So just because a particular issue is mostly carried or mostly embraced or openly embraced by a particular party, doesn't mean you shouldn't sympathize with it. Because you're, first you're a Christian, Right? Second, you're human. Well, first, you're a human being. Second, you're Christian. And then everything else. So, first, act like a human being, act like a Christian, and then everything else will follow. Deep down in your heart, you know I'm telling the truth. See, we can't let the devil rob us of the things that matter to God. He's trying to use politics to divide us, and you're letting him. And I'm speaking to those who are concerned because you're my people. I'm talking to you. Because, see, I don't have, 
um, I, you know, I'm not responsible for the for those who don't claim to embrace conservative values, but I'm responsible for you. We have to learn to embrace and 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 um, and be sensitive to people's struggles, no matter what shade they are, just because you sympathize with the struggle of a homosexual doesn't mean you condone the behavior, right? It doesn't mean you condone your behavior. If they are being mistreated, I can equally say that your behavior is a sin and equally say, I will defend your right not to be abused and taken advantage of. I can defend both at the same time because both are scriptural. The same God who says, being uh, gay is a sin is the same God who says you are not to mistreat people, no matter what their behavior is. See, God will judge you. It's not for me to judge you. So people have legitimate struggles because of betrayal. And you know what? And if we were, if we Christian were nicer. To, to people who embrace other lifestyles, maybe they could be redeemed. But sometimes our behavior does not encourage them to become what we wanted to become. That's the struggle. So Joseph went through legitimate struggle. So turn your Bibles, if you can, to uh, Genesis 40, verse 15. Genesis 40, verse 15. So again, if you have questions or comments, please share those and I will share those in the back end. Genesis 40, verse 15. So Genesis 40, verse 16, here's what it said. It says, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, no, I'm sorry, 40, verse 15. It says, um, for indeed, this is Joseph talking after he's interpreted the dreams of those who were in prison with him. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews and have also done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon, right? So Joseph was facing legitimate struggles in Egypt from, from the pit, he went to the, the slavery and then, and then uh, to the prison. So if you're gonna walk from journey to freedom, you gotta first Revive your dream, reignite your dream, no matter what you've been through, no matter what your past has been. Second, you've got to uh, accept that betrayal is a part of life. Uh, third, you've got to accept that because of the betrayal, you will face struggles and, 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 and you have to sympathize with other people's struggles. Fourth, you have to embrace your greatness. You have to embrace your greatness. Rise to greatness is the next thing. You got to embrace your greatness. Now, so so after Joseph overcame the struggle, he pressed the struggle. He rose to greatness. That's number four. Rise to greatness. Now, so so here's the thing. Some of us, the 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 this, this betrayal and the struggle has made it so that we are afraid to succeed. Right? Rise to greatness. We're afraid to succeed. So, so, so overcome the fear of success because there's destiny in you, right? There, there's significance in you. Your circumstance doesn't define your reality. Your past doesn't define your future. You are afraid to succeed. You are afraid of you. Embrace your greatness. When you see it, don't run from it. Embrace it. Yes, you can. Yes, you will. And yes, you must. So we must accept that despite our struggle, we still can be great. Because our God measures, he measures in taking the little things, the things that have been put out and put down and destroyed and hurt. And the, he, he majors in taking those things and making them great, right? Because for something to be great in God's eye, it must first go through like the diamond or the gold, right? 
So if if we can just get out of the way of God, if you can get out of God's way, he's able to help us as individuals and a collective to realize our full potential despite our past and our vulnerability. America can be great. America can be great. And, and I don't want to say great again because it's a political slogan. And, and the reason I don't necessarily believe in great again, because I don't, I don't really believe that we've ever achieved our greatness. I think we've been in pursuit for, of greatness. Right? Let's not be afraid of America's greatness. And there have been moments where you've seen signs of America's potentials. Right? You can look back and see different moments in history where, where, where there have been these, these sparks of, of America's greatness <clears throat> and potentials. You've seen the same thing with you. You know, as a young man, when I first came to America, actually, even before that, as a kid, I was perceived as, uh, I was stubborn, I was rebellious, I wasn't a studious kid, I wasn't disciplined. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was, I grew up in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wealthy home, but I was, I was a, I, I liked, I loved to play. I was spoiled, I, I loved to play, I loved to hang out. So I, I, I wasn't studious, wasn't disciplined. And I remember one day, my mother was having an event, I forgot what kind of event it was, and I, and I volunteered for the, for the event. And, and I worked so hard and, and I did so well, and people saw a Patrice that they didn't realize. And I remember that day seeing uh, a, a, a greatness in me rise. And I remember how good I felt. And I remember how I wanted to nurture that. And I remember being afraid of that Patrice that I was seeing coming out of me. And I remember feeling like, wait a minute, if, if, if this is how they see me, if, if this is what I become, then, then I can't play anymore. Then I can't relax. And that can't, you see, I can't goof off anymore. So guess what I did? I neutralized my greatness. And then when I came to America, I, I remember when uh, I was in the history class and they were, it was during Black History Month and they were looking for somebody who was gonna give the Black History Month message. It was a predominantly white school and, and nobody wanted to do it. And I raised my hand. Now I remember I was the hoodlum. I was the play guy. I was the basketball player. I was not studious. I had forgotten who I was, but I raised my hand because nobody would. I said, this is Black History Month. you know. <laughs> I wasn't safe at that time. I feel like, you know, come on, we at least got to stand up for black people, right? So I raised my hand as one of the few black people in the class. I said, I'm going to do it. And afterward, they picked me. I said, what in the world did I just do? Right? Because I was a D average student. But I, I accepted. So I worked at it and so forth. I worked hard at it. And then I remember the day of assembly and I gave my speech. I remember getting a, 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 a round of applause and people gave me a standing ovation. I literally remember as I was giving that speech, that I, as I looked at the audience, they, they forgot the old play for Patrice and they saw greatness. And I remember feeling it. And I remember walking down the stage, seeing kind of the potential in me. But guess what I did afterwards? Afterwards, I said, oh my God, it's too much responsibility. I hid it away. If you look at your own past, there have been moments of greatness that God had allowed you to see what you could be, but you've been afraid or you've used your struggles or your betrayal. You've used what you've gone through as an excuse not to unleash the fullness of your potential. What if they come at me again? What if I don't make it? Uh, what, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what? Become the great that God has preordained for you to do. And some of us are afraid to be great because it changes the narrative, right? Because all our excuses goes away. You can't blame the white man anymore. You can't blame your parents anymore, right? You, you can't blame the government anymore. You can't blame your, you can't blame your, see, greatness, let it go, become great. When Joseph saw his chance to become great, he took it, he went after it because he remembered the dream. Right, see, this moment is hard to embrace. This moment, if you forgot the dream, because when you when you have those moments, see, the problem with me was that when I, when those moments of greatness were coming, I couldn't hold on to it because I never had the dream. See, I fi figured, you know, parents got money and life is easy. 
Why dream when you don't have to? Right? I have my new book coming out where I, I tell my story. And, and if you get that book, you'll see the moment when I had a crisis in my life and I had to dream. And that's when everything began for me. Rise to greatness. Yeah, I, I know if you rise to greatness, it changes your narrative because you can't blame the system. You can't blame white people. You can't blame your parents. You can't, because in spite of it all, you still made it. It changed the narrative, but it doesn't matter because it changed the God's narrative. You see, God's, it, it, can remember, it was not them who sent you there, but it was God. Greatness. All of us are born with the potentials to be great. And life's trials and tests are manufacturing processes for us to become the great that we call to be. Not to destroy us, but to perfect us. Rise to greatness. Let's look at Genesis chapter 40, 41, 40. Let's look at it, Genesis 41, 40. I mean, I could go on and on, on the scriptures, but I wanna just give you some very tidbits. By the way, there's gonna be a whole book on this and the whole course that you'll take in the future. But right now I'm kind of teasing you a little bit. So chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter 41, let me read verse 40. Verse 40, here's what it says. It says, um, this is what Pharaoh, let me, let me start at verse uh, 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and my people shall be ruled according to your word, only in regard to the throne, Will you be greater than I? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Rise to greatness. Rise to greatness. Unleash your full potential. Do not allow the narrative to define your outcome, but rather allow your outcome to rewrite the narrative. We've got to stop blaming other people. Greatness is in you. Yes, you've had an abortion. Yes, you were left as a kid, abandoned by your parents. Yes, they abused you. Yes, you faced injustice. Yes, da 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 da, -da. Yes, you didn't finish college. Yes, 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 yes. But in spite of it all, you can rise to greatness. Because after you've marched, what are you going to do? After you've marched, what are you going to do? Rise to greatness. Number four, if we're going to go from, if we're going to journey to freedom, we must not just rise to greatness, but we must forgive. Number five, sorry, we must forgive. Number five. You see, once Joseph rose to greatness, he was not the most powerful man in Egypt, in spite, uh, you know, in uh, other than Pharaoh, and. Guess what happened? The, 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 the boys who sold them in slavery, uh, they ran out of food where they were from. So they had to come to Egypt to get food, right? And as I came to Egypt, guess who was administering the food? It was the slave who they sold. And so as they come and now, and Joseph sees them as they bow before Joseph, it triggers Joseph's mind. He remembers the dream. And he, he, oh, these are the ones who sold me. And then when you read a scripture at every moment, Joseph's behavior shifts. He begins treating them a little differently, right? You might see where he gives them favor, but for the most part, he doesn't trust them, right? Because he had not yet forgiven. He is the most powerful man in Egypt, other than Pharaoh, who now has the opportunity to revenge upon his enemies. Now that you have risen to greatness, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? See, now you're, you're risen to greatness and you have your president of the United States. What are you going to do? Your governor. What are you going to do to the police that abused you? You're a teacher now. You're a lawyer. You're a mayor. You're a CEO of a corporation. You're a senator. You're a congressman. You're a judge. You're a pastor. Right? You are in a position of influence. God has risen. You've allowed, you've embraced your destiny. You're an author. Right? Are you, and now all of a sudden you realize something. Oh my God. As, as you get elevated, you realize you've not dealt 
you've not forgiven the people who caused you to face the struggle, who betrayed you essentially, right? And this is where many of us are stuck. See, because you, you've succeeded in a natural, but you've not succeeded in a spiritual. There's still bitterness in your heart. You still got issues there, man. You know, if you look at the podcast we've, we've done in the last several weeks around this whole George Floyd incident, we've interviewed people and I've asked them, how did you do it? How did you overcome? Because the way they talk, these are African-Americans, the way they talk is as though you've forgiven, or I didn't even tell them the word forgive. I said, you know, you, 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 what was the key? How did you forgive? How did you get through it? I had to go through it. You have to go through it, right? See, because as long as you don't forgive, you're carrying a weight that will hinder you from true success and fulfillment. You will never be free. An unforgiven person never, never achieve true freedom. So can we forgive ourselves and each other for what has happened and be willing to let go of the past and begin to give each other the benefit of the doubt? There's a whole lot there, right? Part of the, the, what the recent incident revealed is that many of us as black has not yet forgiven. And in part for some of us is because we haven't felt that many whites have acknowledged. But, but guess what? I don't need you to acknowledge for me to forgive you. See, because then some of us will be waiting a long time because some people don't know they've done you wrong. Right? You want your, you waiting for your father to, to say, I'm sorry, or your mother to say, I'm sorry, your boyfriend or your husband. Right or or the government or a white person or an Indian or a Chinese whoever you you just put a person there you've been waiting for them to say I'm sorry for you to forgive. Some of them may never say it. Let me tell you a personal story. I, I was a member of a church where God blessed me tremendously, and, and that actually is where I've learned a lot. That's where I became this what the, my spiritual foundation. I, I'll be forever grateful to to my. my uh, to my first pastor for making me the man I am today. And then an incident occurred where I, I got hurt and I felt I was mistreated by the pastor and by the church. And, and, I, and I almost left the church. I was gonna leave unless, but God kept me there. And, and it was a very, I was spiritually wound, wound, wounded. You know, the, the man and the system that I've trusted and put my heart in, how it had wounded me. The greatest wounds are the wounds that comes from those that you love the most and the dearest, right? I felt betrayed. So as so as I was facing that situation and I was going through it, and and, and I remember I was I was in pain and, and it was tough. I kept leading, kept doing things, but I was I was hurting. I was I was hurting. And then one day I was in church, and the pastor's son was preaching. And as he preached, I forgot what the message was, what he said. But he said something about his father. And as he said that, just a lift. That very minute, I forgive. And here was the essence of what happened. He, 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 he told me something about his dad in the sermon. He wasn't talking to me. He was just talking to me. He was preaching. And what I, and what he, he, he took me to the back office where I got to see the man for how he behaves and the ways by which he does things that gave me a clue that first, Patrice, what you're waiting for may never happen. And second, he in his own way have said, I'm sorry, in the, in the way only he can do it. And God used that message to free me up. I literally remember I, I went home. I felt so free because I had forgiven. On Monday, I called the church. I said, hey, I'm back. Whatever we got to do, let's do it. I was a free man, and I've been a free man ever since. And he and I never talked about it. It was a message. So you don't need the person to acknowledge for you to forgive. Because they know what they did wrong. You got to forgive. Right? It may be the word God speaks to you through a prophet like he did for me that day. Maybe he speaks through through a book or he speaks to you right now. He's talking to you or he speaks through through the scriptures. Forgive. Right. 
So, so let's look at G Genesis 45, 45, 5. I'm, I'm going to actually start reading a verse one. Remember this passage that we read earlier, where we started in? Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, make everyone go out from here. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to the brothers. And he wept out loud, and the Egyptians in the house Pharaoh saw. See, Joseph had lost his composure, right? Joseph, he, he at this moment, Joseph was ready to release. He had been keeping it, keeping it, keeping it, keeping it. Verse three, then Joseph said to his brother, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed his prayer. They were afraid, he's gonna kill us, what are you gonna do? Because all this while, Joseph, because he hadn't forgiven, Joseph had been manipulating the whole situation. Could you imagine that, that right there, you saw that the most powerful man is the man you betrayed, right? They're thinking, they, oh, but they're, gonna, they're gonna die right now because he's about to kill him. Then Joseph's brother, please come near me, right? In other words, come near me, intimacy, come near me, right? And then, so they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold in slavery into Egypt. Sorry, verse five. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. I forgive you. Notice they never acknowledged what they had done and they never said they were sorry, but Joseph forgave. Now, watch this. Remember my own story, how I forgave? Well, guess what? What led to Joseph's forgiveness, God spoke to Joseph through Judah. The passage before Judah, his brother, the one who, one of the ones who sold them into slavery, as Joseph is playing his games and tricks, because he had not forgiven. He wasn't fully free yet. He's trying to get Benjamin, his brother, his blood, his brother, same mother, same father, to stay with him. Judah, knowing that they have promised their dad to bring Benjamin back. Remember, they don't know who Joseph is. They don't know that's their brother. They think he's an Egyptian king. So, so, they, so, so, so Judah says, you know what? Take my life in exchange for Benjamin. That incident, Jesus Christ, who is in the loin of Judah. Remember Judah? That's the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, right? So the Messiah himself, the savior, Jesus, the master out of Judah, it wasn't Judah that was acting, just like it was that Judah who sold the boy, it wasn't Judah who saved the boy. It was the devil who sold the boy. It was Jesus who saved the boy. He steps up, say, take my life in exchange for his. Joseph says, oh, my, my, my. If this devilish of a man can stand, take, put his life, because I know him to be selfish, to be wicked. If he's willing to put his life in exchange for my brothers, who am I not to forgive? I forgive you. So here's the question. Who have you not forgiven? Who do you need to forgive? Your father, your mother, your brother, the system, the police, the government, white people, black people, Indian, Chinese, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your mother, your, you follow me, your son, your daughter. Who has hurt you? Who have wounded you? Yes, you're powerful. Yes, you're great. Yes, you are on your way to what God has called you to be. But have you let go of the past? Have you forgiven? Because if you're not forgiven, that thing's going to creep up again. Let me speak to black people. Listen, forgive. Forgive. Let go. Let go. Yeah, I know it still happens, but let go. Yes, I know. Let's let go. Let go. Forgive. Forgive because you're called to greatness and you're never going to achieve all that God has for you until you forgive. Yes, you can march, but forgive. Forgive. How do I know you forgive? Because you march in peace. How do I know you forgive? Because your words speak not of hate and revenge and anger, but your words speak of love and passion. Forgive. Let go. Be 
what you, they were not to you. Forgive. Number six, we're almost there. Number six, if you can forgive, then here's what happens next. Because you are on your way to, 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 to freedom. You can forgive. That's going to happen. God is going to reveal his full destiny to you. Yeah. The next thing is destiny. God is going to reveal the full his full destiny to you. You follow me? Because up on tonight, you think you're great now. You ain't seen nothing yet, baby. <laughs> Let you forgive and watch what I promise you. Forgive. And if God does not reveal destiny and take you to a place you've not seen before, I give you your money back. Guaranteed. Forgive. Watch this. We will, will we walk in our destiny? I like BB said, be what there was not to you. Amen. Thank you, BB, for recording that back. That's a good word. So, so will we walk in our destiny? Because once we're forgiven, we must prepare our hearts for God to reveal our destiny of his ultimate purpose for us as individuals and as a collective. I, for one, believe in the destiny of America. I believe that America's promise is yet ahead of us and there's, there's no devil that can stop us if we put our minds together, trust Jesus, and be willing to go after it. I believe in the destiny of our families. I believe in the destiny of you. Whatever country you're in, your country has a destiny. Whatever family you're from, your family has a destiny. Whoever you are, you have a destiny. Let's look at it. Look at um, uh, Genesis chapter 45. Um, look, at, look, at, look at verse 5. But now, therefore, do not be grieved or be angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent before you preserve life. Watch this. For these two years of famine has, has been in the land, there are still years in which there will not be plowing nor, 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 uh, nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity and for you, for you in the earth and to save lies by a great deliverance. Are you following me? In other words, your destiny, look, look at this. Your destiny is not your greatness. See, your destiny is the reason why God is making you great. Let me say it again. Because see, people, once you get that position, once you get that money, once you get to that place, you get them degrees, whatever it is, once you get to that place of greatness, you know, yeah, make America great again. But for what? Why? See, great is not great just for great sake. Great is great for purpose. So destiny is the purpose for your greatness. Are you following me? But, but see, you cannot get to destiny unless you forgive and God shows you the why. And once God shows you the why, oh my God, you thought you were free before, now you have true freedom. Now you have true freedom. Destiny. Will you let God show you your destiny? Will you believe him until he shows it to you? Now, let me tell you something about the destiny of African American. If you're African Americans and you're listening, let me tell you what your destiny is as a collective, as a collective, based on this story. Think about it. Today, Africa, my homeland, the place that I was born, I was born in Africa. I was adopted in, Af in America, but I was born in Africa. So Africa, the child of my birth, I mean, the, the home of my birth, sold your parents, all right? We betrayed you, all right? You were Joseph. We sold you in slavery. Now, watch this. At the moment we sold you, we were, even though we were coming down, but we, we were still a continent that was free, right? And, and we, we had... I, 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 the, I, the days of greatness were kind of, we were, we were no longer where we were before, but we were experiencing 
at that moment, something different than now. Watch this. There were still kings and queens that rule Africa. My grandfather, who was a king, right? They still rule at that moment. And Africa was viewed as a sovereign continent. And you had this country that was pride. And, you know, it, it wasn't the greatness they once had because obviously at this point they were trained their own. But, but, but they still had a sense of dignity. Fast forward. Today, the same Africa that sold you is the continent with the poorest people in the world. Let me give you context. The world have reduced the poverty rate to 10%. The world, in other words, if there are a million people in the world, 100,000 of them are poor. Okay, so so the world's poverty rate today is 10 percent. You know, through free enterprise and all that is reduced the poverty rate of the world to 10 percent. Watch this. Africa, one continent, have 90 percent of the. Million people in the whole world, 100,000 are poor. That means they earn below $2.50 a day. Okay, 90,000 are poor. In the 90, I'm sorry, 100,000 are poor. The 100,000 that are poor, there's 10,000 spread all over the world, and there's 90,000 of them in the continent of Africa from where you were sold from. Not done. Besides that, if you, if you look at it statistically, if you look at the statistic of education and technology access and knowledge even, and currency, money, you know, cash, the collective of blacks in America have more education, more technology, and more money, cash, than the entire continent of Africa. Cash, not natural resources. I'm talking about cash. So the wealthiest blacks collectively are not in Africa where you were sold from. They are here in America where you were sold to. And you helped to create that. What the devil meant for evil God use it for good. So you are the Joseph. So guess what? Guess who is coming for your help? Judah, Simeon, right? All of those that sold you into slavery. That is your destiny. And until you can rise and embrace that sense of destiny. In other words, no, you're not a welfare queen a welfare king, right? You are a multimillionaire. You are a billionaire. Are you following me? You are, you, you, you are a captain of industry. You are an educator. You are the top and not the bottom. You are above and not beneath. Embrace your destiny. And, and watch this. And as you embrace your destiny, all the fears, all of the stuff they've done to you is going to fall away. And the king and the queen that is in you is going to rise. In other words, start living for others, living for somebody. Start being a giver and no longer a receiver. You are, I like what Bibi said, you are royalty, my friend. See, today the Africans are royalty too, but they're poor. But you are royalty with the real money. Yes, I know there's a lot of money in the, in the, under the African soil, but they have a long ways to get there because of corruption, because of health situation, because of education. But you got it, baby. Think about it. So thank God for your situation. That's what Joseph said. No, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. Because he saw the future. Listen, Africa was on its way down. Whites didn't cause that downfall. White only edited it. They were on their way down. 
God knew that cotton was going down. He had to send some black folks a way to prepare in the future to save the Africans. You got to understand that. You've got to embrace that. Stop blaming white people and embrace your destiny. And then finally, the final is legacy. Once you understand destiny, now you've got to understand legacy. This is where freedom rests, legacy. You got to pass it on. In other words, what legacy are you willing to leave to your children? Whatever age you are, wherever you want to continue, if your freedom begins today, what legacy? The Bible says a, a wealthy man, a rich man is an inheritance for his children's children. You see, see, we as Christian, we must act and live in such a way that we can impact at least three generations. Our generation, the next, and the following. Your great, your, your grandchildren, right? What legacy? What legacy do we want to collectively leave for America? Can, can we all agree that we're willing to live in such a way that something like the Joy Floyd incident will not happen to our children or our grandchildren? Can we all collectively agree to that? Do you want to leave a legacy of hate? A legacy of division? A legacy of writing? Or do you want to leave a legacy of love? A legacy of prosperity, of wealth, a legacy of purpose and destiny, right? Because the future is going to hold us responsible. The future is going to hold you and I responsible. What legacy? Think about the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Can that generation rise again? Think of the legacy of those who fought in World War I and World War II. Think of the legacy of those in the 60s who gave rise to freedom all over the world, right? The Patrick Lumumba's, right? Think of the legacy of those people. What's, what will your legacy be? Will you be part of the generation that creates a mark so that down the line, the children can look back and thank God for you because you paid a price? I remember um, one of the podcasts we did was uh, Shea Bynes. And Shea Bynes talked about her father who had a, who, who faced a lot of prejudice and racism and he fought for it and he was a white hater. And then God freed him up. And then he, and then he turned around and he wanted his children to have a legacy of love, a legacy of unity, a legacy of what America can be. And this white hater began to teach his children and intentionally take his children in places where they can interact with white people and begin to learn about what America can be. And today, he has Shea Bynes, who when you talk to her, you have no idea of where she comes from because his father made a decision to forgive, to change, and to set a new course for his children. What will your legacy be? Look at Genesis 50. And we're going to close there. Genesis 50. Guys, thank you so much. And then as I close, I'm going to read some of the comments you posted up. And then we'll wrap up. Look at what Genesis 50. Verse 25. It says this. So Joseph. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying. Now, this is Joseph on his deathbed as the man who saved the nation, the slave who became king, right? The prisoner who became prime minister, right? He, as, as, as he was in his dying bed, as his family are around him, as he's dying, as the monarch of the family, as the prince is dying, right? Look at what he said. He says, I'm dying, but God will visit you and bring you out of this land, the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? As he's dying, what does he do? He says, listen, as comfortable as this is, as wonderful as Egypt is, this is not home. This is not home. 
God gave a promise to our great grandfather, Abraham, right? And that promise had been passed on, on, and now I'm passing it on to you. You've got to carry the baton. You got to carry the baton, right? He says, then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you. You shall carry my bones from here. And so Joseph died. So he gave them a mandate. He said, listen, things are great right now. And we are facing great because we saved the nation. We are royalty in this place, but this is not home. And you know the Bible because, you know, in Exodus chapter one, there came a king that knew not Joseph. And that began what led to the Exodus. What will your legacy be? And what legacy are you living for your children? Guys, listen, like you, it's been tough for me. First COVID-19, then the social unrest. I'm not sure what's going to be next, but I've made a decision. I'm going towards freedom. What are you going to do? So I'm inviting you to come with me. Dream again. Dream again. Revive your sense of America's greatness. Dream again. Dream again. Remember the dream that your mama taught you. Dream again. Dream again. Second, understand that you may be betrayed again. You may be betrayed again. Right? You may be. It's, it's part of sin. It's part of life. You may betray, but do not let that stop you. Because your dream, as you begin to dream again, guess what? You may invite folks who are going to be jealous. Who do you think you are? Whatever. That, don't care. Press. Let them betray you. Because what they mean for evil, God will use it for good. And, and as you face betrayal, understand it's going to lead to some struggles. You're going to face struggles. But that's okay. Right? Because the struggles will shape you and make you the person you're becoming. And then as you face the struggles, embrace your greatness. Get out of the way and let God lift you up to become the person that he wants you to become. Change the narrative. Yes, when you, when you rise to greatness, you can't blame people anymore. Right? When you rise to greatness, you, you, you can't you know, be the victim anymore. But that's good. You don't want to be a victim. You want to be a victor. And then as you rise to greatness, forgive. Let go of the past. Let go of the past. And as you let it go, embrace your destiny. As God speaks to you about the things he has for you, embrace it. And as you embrace it, pass it on. Pass it on. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this message, Journey to Freedom. If you've enjoyed it, I want you to share with as many people as you can. Because the only way we're going to change the narrative is that those of us of goodwill who want a united America, who want a great America, and who want a world that enables you, and enables us to be able to achieve all that God has called us to achieve, is that we begin to have different narratives. All right? So we got to share this as much as you can. And as we share it, I want to invite you to go to our website and learn about other tools that we have, training, coaching, access to capital, ways that we can partner along with you and help you to realize the call and purpose that God has called you to realize. All right. And as you connect, join the e-community, become a member, right, so that we together can walk together towards this journey of freedom. Guess what? If you become a member, you'll start getting our weekly devotionals. And, and that means you get the details of this. We have uh, next week, we're going to deal with the, the, the struggle, right? And then each week, we're going to deep dive into a particular point of this, and you'll get it until it's all over. And as you get it, right, you can share with others and you can allow that to minister to you, all right? Nancy, thank you so much. Brian, thank you. Ruth, thank you. BB, thank you. Um, and actually, you know what? Um, uh, let me see. I want to read a scripture because uh, before we close real quick, um, Nancy put a scripture up and, and um, Isaiah 26. Nancy, I'm going to read that scripture that you put up because it's going to bless. We're going to close that scripture. All right, guys, hang with me for a minute. I'm going to close in a minute. By the way, if you want more information about us, go to nehemiahecommunity.com. And also, don't forget, we have Nehemiah Week coming up. 
Nehemiah Week, which is our conference that we have each year, is digital between from August 10th to August 15th. You want to go to our website, register, because you register before June 30th, we have 50% off registration. We have a number of great speakers, including myself, that will be speaking on that day. So join us there. So Isaiah uh, 26. All right. So Isaiah 26. I'm going to read what the, Isaiah 26. So verse 3. Verse 3 says this. You will keep, you will keep him in perfect peace, my Lord, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever. For, for for in Yahweh, the Lord is everlasting strength. Amen, amen, amen to that. Let me pray for you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord enable you to steward those talents that he's placed under your care. And may he enable you to steward them in such a way that one day you can you will hear those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. He'll now make you rule over much and you can pass on the legacy. God bless you. Thank you guys for being here with me.